Welcome everybody again to the first Worldwide Online Harp Congress interview. Today we have a special guest again as every day and I'm very pleased to welcome you especially in the afternoon because this is the first time we do the interview also at two o'clock the Central European time. And we have very special guest Sionet Williams from United Kingdom. And I'm very pleased to invite her because she was principal harpist of the BBC Symphony for 30 years. And she will have a lot of experiences to, to share with us. She was, of course, as otherwise, she was performing at the Third World Harp Congress in Vienna in 1987. And she was performing there the Spiders, the very famous piece by Paul Patterson. And I'm sure she will have a lot of things to talk about and to, to memorize from, from not only from that Congress, but because she's also involved in the Congress of Cardiff, which was supposed to be this year, but is postponed for the next year. So certainly she will have a lot of things to share with us. And I will be very happy if you can join us by messages and share any of your questions which you would like to have for our guest. So I would like very welcome, very warm welcome for Sionet Williams. Hello everybody. Thank you. Hello. That was very nice. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really going to look forward to speaking to you and telling you all about <laughs> life in 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 here. Right <laughs> life over here. We are very delighted that you are here with us and that you had time for, for this interview. So please tell me something about your performance, because of course, I don't know if, if that time when you performed Spiders, it has been the very first time it has been performed or it has been already premiered before. Okay, I premiered it in the Wickham Hall in London uh, before that. So that was the first European premiere in Vienna. Um, and um, I've known Paul Patterson for a number of years because I studied at the Royal Academy of Music. And at that time, Paul was um, head of composition, I think, or head of new music, whatever. I can't remember exactly the title, but all, always I'm, I love new music. So we spoke to him a lot about composition. Um, and um, I also, at another point, was uh, teaching on the National Youth Orchestra course and all the other instrumentalists, apart from the harpists, had um, composers working with them, but the harpists were just left alone. And I said, hang on, what's going on? Paul Patterson is here teaching everyone else. Why isn't he working with harpists? So I got him to work with harpists and he's worked with harpists ever since. Um, but the piece came to me, not as you would expect actually. Um, so I'm going to go back to the actual origins of that piece. I was very, very fortunate to study with two, well, I've studied with several harpists, but in London, I was studying at the Royal Academy of Music with um, Renata Scheffelstein, who was absolutely brilliant, um, and Oshan Ellis, um, and Oshan Ellis being a, a fellow Welshman, of course, as I am. I'm from the UK, but I have to stress I'm Welsh. <laughs> um, and um, I was working with Oshan, and Oshan didn't really, or doesn't, he's still here with us, Oshan, he's amazing, um, doesn't really like, um, at that point, didn't want to do much contemporary music. But the North Wales Festival, St. Asaph, is a big international festival, had asked Paul Patterson to write a piece for Oshan. And it is, this piece actually started off as three, and many don't know this, as three bagatelles for Oshan Ellis. But Oshan, who not only was my teacher, but actually lived not far from me, um, asked me if I would look at it because he was didn't want to move on with new music. He thought it was going to be a, it was a good piece, but maybe needed some help. So I said to Paul, "What do you think?" Because it's a bit cheeky because you've written a piece for Oshan. He's performed it, and he said, "No, no, I like to work with you on it because I'm not I, I haven't written for harp, and we should write together. We should you should show me how." So Paul can answer you. I'm sure Paul will be online, but I'm sure Paul will tell you I gave him a hard time. Uh, I've worked with now hundreds probably of composers and given them all a hard time probably, but it's for the sake of the harp that we do it so that we have some great compositions for the instrument. So we took the, I took the piece and we changed it quite a lot. And Paul had an interest in spiders, um, I think from Australia, if I remember correctly. And so all of these pieces just seem to work out as um, uh, he was describing these spiders and he said, this is definitely spiders. That was definitely his idea. And so it grew out of an original piece, but it became spiders. And I gave spiders, uh, the new piece, its premiere in London in the Whitmore Hall. And then um, I played at several um, harp congresses. I don't know which came before Vienna, but I played in two, I think in Holland, all with stories attached. 
Um, and then I came to play in Vienna, which was such an honor. Um, and I played two programs, actually. I did that because there was a new music, a whole new music composition um, program. I think everybody could play one new piece. And I represented Britain, I think, with that piece. Um, and sadly, Paul wasn't there. He's been at so many hard things since, but at that time he wasn't there. But I th if I remember correctly, um, it was chosen as the best new piece. And certainly I remember it having a most incredible acceptance. And um, I was chosen from Vienna to represent Britain then in the European Harp Symposium in Berlin the following year, playing British music. And of course, I took Paul's piece with me. Um, and um, since then, the rest is history because he then had a gap when he didn't write for Harp, if I remember correctly. Um, and then later on, um, we were together again. I said, why aren't you writing more for And then suddenly, a great harp department at the academy, um, now with um, Karen Bourne at the helm, um, uh, and it used to be um, Skylar Kanga, now it's Karen Bourne at the helm. They had lots of fantastic harpists, and I said, why aren't we working with Paul Patterson? So they all decided they would work with Paul Patterson. And of course, as you know, he has written many, many pieces since then. And the last piece he wrote for me, I had a very big birthday concert on my 60th birthday, which sadly to say is, six years ago now, I don't want to know about it. Um, and I did something rather controversial, I suppose. I could have played a lot of different styles of music as I often do, as I mostly do. But I thought, no, I'm into new music. Why don't I commission six, it was 60, I was 60. So on my 60th birthday, I decided to, if you like, invigorate myself by doing something interesting for the 10 years from my 60th and my 70th. So I designed something called Shonet Spiraling 60th, spiraling, because I've always had a very interesting and spiraling in and out of highs and lows kind of life. Um, and I asked Paul if he would write me a piece and he actually wrote me a piece called Spirals, which was one of the pieces of the six new pieces I played in then in the South Bank in the Purcell room. And so that's the last piece he wrote for me. But as you know, he's written many, many other pieces for, for harpies and extended spir spiders, to be with string quartet and mini concerto and he's developing his works all the time that's amazing we really need mm -hmm. such a fantastic composers and of course this inspiring mm -hmm. as you are that's amazing so spiders were the very first piece he has written for the harp right yes it was the first piece he ever wrote for harp yes but it has but become a quite famous piece for the harpies because it was also as a required piece for the competitions, as I know, and it was really, it was already quite often played. Oh, it's been played more than practically anything, I should think of 20th century as it was then when he wrote a piece, I'm sure. Um, and of course, Paul's now been involved with the World Harp Congress and he was an invited composer, um, I think. I think in Hong Kong, I think. I can't quite remember where, but anyway, he was, and he'll, he'll correct me. Um, and of course, he's known throughout the world. And um, it's nice because, you know, often people only write one piece for harp. I've had dozens of composers write for me. Um, and they, most of them only write one piece for the harp, which is a, a sad thing. Um, but it takes a lot of working together. And I think from their point of view, it is a very complex instrument to write for, and you have to be patient with anyone, no matter how great they are. The harp is incredibly complex to write for. Um, we've had great composers from, you know, from before, of course, um, and but but now there's so many possibilities with the instrument, and never mind the electric harp and all the rest of it, but just with a normal pedal harp, that it's good that they can write for it in, in an idiomatic way and that they work with somebody. I've never minded spending as long as is necessary working with a composer, providing they then um, really do take on board all the complexities and go away and, and interest themselves in writing for it. And I don't mind not co-writing, but you know, helping to extend the piece or working with someone in close contact. But I think with the harp, you really have to in order to get a really great piece. Um, and I'm happy if people write more than one piece, the same composer writes more than one piece for the harp. It doesn't happen all the time. Maybe also you have to think of it commercially from their point of view. It may be that it's less commercial than a piece for another instrument which might get played a lot more and published easier. I have a lot of great pieces in my cupboard which are not published. 
um, and some of the composers have now died. And I hope that I can publish them sometime. But they, because some of them are one, well, absolutely wonderful. But um, I don't know their estates. I don't know what's happened. How I can how I can publish some of them. Um, so w anyway, there's masses of new music now, and that's a good thing that there's a lot of um, creativity going on in, in new music for the harp. We really need a lot of new music. I know when I was playing with Mr. Satoros Propovich, he was the one who told me the new music is the one which can force the, the young people on because, of course, the composers can really play a new, make new music and the, the new harpists or new performers can produce uh, and uh, uh, represent then, then uh, the composers as well. So I know that it's really, really important, not only for the repertoire, but for the instrument itself to have new music. Oh, I, I've, I've all, always thought that. I mean, I've always been very um, wide in my um, uh, repertoire extension. I love all kinds of music. I mean, I studied, you know, I studied, I did double first study piano and harp at Welsh College of Music and Drama. So I, I got the benefit of working with an amazing piano teacher as well. I started on piano when I was very young anyway. And so I've always loved the fact that I've learned about general music. And one thing I don't like about the harp is that it can be very exclusive and mm -hmm. is in itself. And I've always been first, hopefully, a musician first, and I happen to play a harp. I've always thought that's the most important thing, is to embed myself with loads of great musicians who are not just harpists. That's nothing to do with not, not being wanting to play with harpists. I'm just saying it's important that we realize how our worth is compared to other musicians on other instruments and singers and how to sing you learn how to phrase so working with singers you learn that working with other instrumentalists you realize how it is and then you find other compositions for other instruments and then you realize what the standard should be in the harp and uh, that's not to say i i do all kinds of things i i i went and got a manuscript of bach from um uh, I think, I can't remember where I got it from now, but one of these difficult to find pieces. Um, and, and I spent two years learning how to um, edit that for the harp um, and worked on, was it for triple harp? I even went for dance classes to realize how the minuet and the dance and all those were, were, were performed so that I could play them in the right style. Um, and, and, and so I'm, you know, and I, I'm, I'm now working on, I worked on John Parry and the Welsh composers and John Thomas, who I, I think, again, has had a bad press because they, people think it's salon music, but we don't look at it in the correct way if that's what we think. John Thomas was playing in salons. He was playing in, play, in major places and was liked by Berlioz and, and Rossini and uh, all these people. We must remember it's the style of the time. It's what, how we interpret it that matters. And nowadays with new music, New music, again, doesn't have to be um, unattainable and acceptable. A lot of my friends say, oh, you're playing new music, I won't be coming to that. And I say, we don't even know what it sounds like. Not every new music is way out or hard for your ear. You might like something that somebody else doesn't like. It doesn't have to be um, nasty sounding. Um, in fact, I never play nasty sounding anything. If I don't think the music's worthwhile, I don't play it. I think the music has to come first. If the music has to come first, and I've tried, I know a lot of people play brilliant, absolutely amazing um, uh, versions of, uh, you know, arrangements of pieces written for other instruments. Um, um, and Ian was on saying that he does, and he does brilliantly. I mean, they, they all, all these people do them brilliantly, but I've stayed away from that because I've got enough original music that I hardly ever play arrangements of anything because I, do, I really don't need to, and others can, and play them brilliantly and make their own arrangements. I rather look for original music from every century um, and, um, and get new music written for me. Although, having said that, any composer out there, I need a rest. <laughs> I don't know if I want any new music. I've got plenty to go on at the moment. <laughs> We are absolutely amazing that what you are everything doing and really how much you enrich the repertoire only only by searching new music, which is very important for, for our repertoire as well, you know, because I totally agree with your point of view that uh, John Thomas, which is rarely played in these days, just because there is some kind of view from the harp is that it's not so so quality music but i think that exactly what you said it's the part of the the period of time when how they were writing is the same with elias parish alvars or these kind of uh, composition yeah absolutely and i think the thing is that um perhaps you don't know but um 
I left the BBC Symphony Orchestra just about two years ago now. Um, and immediately, much to my surprise, after handing in a piece of research, because I've always done a lot of research, writing research, I love writing, um, I've always done it. Um, my first LP, <laughs> that's how old I am, they're not CDs, they were LPs, of John Parry came out like 50 years ago or something, uh, for no, 40 years ago. Um, and, and then my John Thomas followed, and I got a lot of, um, uh, programs on radio and television in, in, in Britain about it. And now, since I left the orchestra two years ago, I thought, what am I going to do? Because I had a, a change of, quite a big change of life. Um, and I put in a piece of research to the Royal Academy of Music, to the research department, um, and they offered me a research fellowship immediately, which shocked me. Um, so I've got that title. It's an honorary title, so it's not a paid position, but it's for me to be able to um, have a place where I can perform my scripted versions of the story of John Thomas. I've studied his life. I need to have another 100 years to study more of his life because I don't think yet that the harpists ever know what his life was and who he worked with. Um, um, you know, that the things that the other composers who we all know about of the day said about him, Rossini and Mayer and all these people, that those things we don't know. But my, my, um, my research has to be split because it's so much. So I first started with the solo works and then I'm now starting with the duo works. I launched a duo this January actually in the Royal Academy of Music with Anne Denholm Oh, who was, um, oh, well, she's a fantastic harpist, uh, half my age. And so thank you, Anne, for uh, uh, willing to play with me as a duo. Um, and together we're doing the duos of John Thomas with scripted, um, I do a script of uh, about the duos and who he played them with and all the research about them. If you saw my room, you won't see much because I'm in a new room, so there's nothing on the wall yet, but it's strewn with about a thousand pieces of paper now about John Thomas from all past newspapers and cuttings and reviews and 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 all all things. Thankfully, I speak Welsh, so I can read Welsh and I can read some of those things that are in Welsh, of course, which helps me a lot. So I have a, I always have this mixture of works that I do, uh, and and I love you know I love that that side of things that I can do all sorts of things. <laughs> And are you planning to do some, uh, to write a book about John Thomas? That might come, but actually, to be honest with you, why the Academy actually said they gave me that was because, although, yes, I may be able to write a book eventually, um, what I love doing is live performance with scripted wor words that I've scripted on that particular area of John Thomas, that particular aspect. Um, and that does require writing masses of words, thousands and thousands of words, which I do for the scripts, but they are for presentation verbally. And that's a lighter thing than writing a book, which is more academic. And they say, okay, they, it's academic because you've researched it thoroughly. So it's, of course, it's academically um, sourced, but when you present it to an audience, as I shall do hopefully next year in the World Health Congress, I've got a lecture recital on John Tom. It's more for you to have in a, I'll do quotes and things, which which you could do in a book, but it won't be John Thomas was born in that. You know, it's like making the quote so that it's more um, enjoyable for an audience who are listening, and also I get to play the music. That's very very great. Coming back to your performance in Vienna, do you have any memory? Because I don't know, it was your first time to be at the World Harp Congress. As we were talking yesterday with Alfredo, for him it was not the first one. He was uh, performing already at the first one in Maastricht. So how about you? What? Sorry, I didn't catch your last one, but I think you were asking me how I how was the trip to Vienna. Yes, I mean, how how if you have any memory for Vienna or if it was your first experience in the. Well, Yes, yes. Well, I I wanted to encourage students to go to Vienna with me or to go, and they said they couldn't afford them, but the rest of them. Anyway, I, I loaned my very poor vehicle to the mother of one of my students who lived in Scotland. I, live in, I lived in London. They drove down, we swapped vehicles, and she gave me a big vehicle, and I drove to Vienna with two students, one Scottish, one Irish, and a friend of the Irish harpist, um and we drove with my gold harp in the back loads of food for them when they were staying together in a flat i had decided to be uh aside from them when i got to vienna so i could concentrate otherwise i'd be talking all the time not sleeping so i decided to stay in a hotel 
I d we drove to Vienna very successfully. We parked the car, everything was fine. I did play Patterson's uh, first. I had two programs actually in Vienna. I played Patterson and I had not been well at all the day before. I said, my foot is hurting. And I was in the hotel with a very great friend of mine, Kay Swift from Kent. And she, her parents were both doctors. And she looked at my foot and said, I think you're very ill. You should go to the hospital. And I said, no, 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 no. I've got to play spiders now. I'm fine. And she's, we, so after it, we went to hospital and they said, you are very ill. I think we, we, we think you've got gangrene in your leg, which my leg was starting to swell. And I said, I can't stay here. Whatever happens, I have to go and play, I don't know, a Welsh program, I think it was, the next day. And they said, well, no, 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 you're not going to. Anyway, I played the Welsh program. I collapsed after it. I was taken to the hospital. Um, and they, um, well, they administered something to my leg. They, they did an operation with no anesthetic because they didn't have any in that particular hospital because it was uh, not a hospital for operations, if you like. And then I had to fly home, air ambulance, leaving behind my students, my harp, everything, all my belongings. I had to get on an air ambulance with my friend and I was deposited back in London flat. I didn't see my half or the students for five days when I had a complete panic attack because I didn't think any of them could drive. So I thought my insurance would bring the car back. So I, I thought they would get to fly. Nobody told me that the insurance didn't pay because we hadn't told them that I was ill before asking for repatriation of the vehicle. So they didn't want to know. So my Irish student, Ema Kenny, thank you Ema if you're listening, drove the vehicle back she'd already passed the test if i remember correctly in ireland six weeks before and she drove my car back with the other students and deposited everything back in my flat in london and i then was very poorly for for a long time i did have i nearly lost my leg in vienna that's my story of vienna <laughs> but you know anyway yeah it took a long time to heal and my lovely sister came to pick me up and took me to wales to recuperate in 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 mid wales by the seaside um but um it had a, an impression on me. <laughs> Unbelievable experience. Oh my God, what a memory. Oh, I'm so sorry that you have not such a pleasant uh, experience from that, but still you, you had really fantastic success at the concert, as I remember. Yes, yes, I, everybody loved it. So that's all that matters, and uh, that I played my best despite everything. I thought if I could do it with that, I could do it. I can do it with anything now. Um, it was foolish. I wouldn't recommend anybody to do it because it was too dangerous. You shouldn't do that. But um, um, I'm not very good at heeding advice because I've had plenty of advice about health. And sometimes I listen, sometimes I don't. But, um, uh, you know, um, I just carry on because there is nothing else one can do but carry on. Absolutely. We have to sometimes really go on and uh, the people should, should just not mention anything what we are dealing with, right? I try, although I have to tell you something that I think is quite important is that, you know, after years of playing solo and traveling, I was traveling all over, well, mainly Europe, and Britain has a lot of places, so it wasn't difficult. I was also, um, at the same time, I was acting principal harp of two orchestras before the BBC, the Sinfonietta in London, which does nothing but new music um, and um, the Philharmonia, which does all kinds of music. So I was doing a lot of things and recording. Um, I was teaching at the Royal College of Music when I was a student at the Royal Academy of Music in the junior department. Mm -hmm. um, I was already teaching when I was in sixth form of school. I was playing professionally when I was 16. I had to, to earn money to, to keep a harp. So um, then after all these wonderful trips and, and all these things, I was wondering, um, the, the BBC Symphony Orchestra asked me in several times before I got the job because their harpist sometimes wants you to do other things. And Sidoni Goosens, who was the principal harpist there for about 40 something years, um, she was due to retire. And then John Marson took over. And I would go in quite often to deputize just as a first harp or second harp. And mm -hmm. um, they all um, were nearing leave, well, Sidoni Gusens had left and John wasn't sure he wanted to carry on there. And so I very early on, um, before I got the job, I started to work with Boulez in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And then after that, every time Boulez came, I worked with him in the orchestra. And before I got the audition for the job, I was sensing, would I like a permanent job? Because I had been freelancing very successfully. I wasn't sure at all I wanted a permanent job. I also did, you know, people don't know, but I did light music. I played in pantomime for three years running, 
dressed as Harper Marx with a wig on. I liked improvising. I liked light music. I played with BBC Light Orchestra. I played with a radio orchestra playing light music. I learned about all those things. So when the job came up, I was a bit hesitant and people said, oh, you should go for it. You like modern music, you like contemporary music. I, yes, I do, but I wasn't sure I wanted to be in a permanent orchestral position on one which I knew would hold me tight because it's not an orchestra where deputies can come in as easily as others because of the new music and because we were live on radio, I think three times a week, which is huge. And we were playing new music, which we had to learn sometimes overnight and working with composers all the time. But um, I did um, do the audition, was offered the position, decided very quickly before I said no to say yes. <laughs> and as soon as I got the job, um, it was a very, um, it was a, a crucial year in my life really, because I got the job. I'd been divorced a year earlier. I'm still friendly and I think you'll be online with my ex-husband who lots of harpists know, because we ran a lot of the UK Harp Association together. That's Kim Sargent. We have we were happily divorced um, and we're still good friends. And then I got remarried in the same year, I think, as I got the BBC Synth job. And I hadn't got the job long before I discovered that I had a rare illness. Now, normally it's not the thing to talk about, as you said, about what's wrong with you. But I have to say that at this age, I feel it's really important that people know it isn't an illness, actually. It's a disability. I was born with some without an enzyme so anyway it's complicated but it hit me within months of getting the job and i was told that i should never play the harp again and that in fact if i did i would not really survive and that i shouldn't use my muscles in that way because my problem is with all my skeletal muscle um i can't use them in the way any of any of you can anybody without the illness it's called mccardle's disease and i was shy of it but i had to tell the orchestra because it was I had to go to hospital many times. I mean, every free day when I wasn't at work, I was going to hospital because they were doing some work on me because I was. it was very rare. It still is very rare. Um, but nowadays I feel not only um, not shy to speak of it, but it's important because we don't, we hide away from things like this. Um, and it's not so that you can say, oh, poor, poor Sean, poor, woe is her. She's got this thing and she still plays a harp. No, it's because people with it often think, and that's all, they can't do anything. I decided after one month of crying that if I couldn't play a harp after all I'd done in my life, it wouldn't be worth living. So the option wasn't really there for me. I decided I would go and play. And if that finished me off, then I would finish off playing. What a great thing to do. So I carried on. The orchestra was very um, um, understanding. And, and um, you know, you wouldn't have known in the orchestra, hopefully, most of the time that anything what was wrong with me but well, i've had to deal with it in my own way um and i'm now um, working with the association of glycogen storage disorders here in britain um to um make sure that people um don't treat people in the wrong way because we are all with our illness we don't get found out until later on because we don't look ill we don't look ill at all and it's we suffer inside a lot and people don't recognize it in us and then they call us they say that we're lazy or that we are, we're shy or, or we don't want to do something or we're, we're lazy. I've never been lazy in my life. Um, and now it's, it's, it's the right time. And, and now that I'm doing less with harp work in general, you wouldn't believe it, but probably less. Uh, I will do more with the charity because we need to tell the world that um, we have to be careful to be kind to people and not to, to um, and to listen when people say, I need to do this, I need to stop now, or I need to, you know, please listen, because uh, other people might, you know, other harpist friend of ours might be suffering from other things. I think we, we have to learn to be a bit tolerant of things. And after that, that's it then. <laughs> we don't need to talk about it anymore. But thank you for giving me the opportunity, um, because, you know, it's shy when you have something wrong. Any musician, anybody in the place whose face is in the public eye, you don't want to say these things, otherwise you're not going to get booked for the gig or you're not going to do this. I used to worry about not how can I play in a prom, but how do I walk from the dressing room to the prom stage and get on stage in front of people? These are the things that worry me. Where's my car going to be? You know? But anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm still playing and I'm still here.
<laughs> Sionet, you are amazing woman. You are really the example and really the one of some very strong women who went through such a difficult moments and you are really amazing. Also outside, inside, you are just fantastic lady. So you are an example for all of us and inspiration. No, and I really no. admire. <laughs> it's very kind of you. It isn't that, it's about that if anybody um, knows me, they will come and talk to me because they know I listen. But you know, in 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 a, in a difficult world of music, music is very um, often very bitchy. You know, people speak about people, they criticize your performance. Mm -hmm. You have to be always in charge. And I just say, you know, even with the performers, I'm not very competitive. You speak a lot about competitions, and I never went. You 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 know, people have always asked me. Anne Griffiths used to say, "Come with me to Israel." You, you, you know, because she wasn't my teacher, but she was for a short while. Um, and I didn't, I never wanted to go. Well, first of all, um, I've always thought there was, that I had a lot of work to do to earn a living anyway. So I was busy. I didn't need to spend weeks just learning a program. But on top of that, I'm not very competitive with anyone else. I'm competitive with myself. I want the best from me. And if I can do the best, I will do it. Um, but, you know, I do think competition has a place. Of course it has. Um, and if you see what competitions I have won, there have been some. They've never been for harp only. They've been for all instruments. And if I won those or did well in them, if I was applauded or given some good advice or good comments, that's where I felt that I had learn something from listening to all these other people and having comments from different kind of people. The, the, the big competition I did win, which was um, a very big help for me, was the Concert Artist Guild in New York. Mm -hmm. um, my first husband was my manager for all the years that I was a soloist. We met at the Academy and he sent a tape off without me even realizing probably to the World Hub, uh, to the um, Concert Artists Guild and it got accepted and I had to go to New York. It's different now because you can do rounds in different countries. I really had to go there and do three rounds of playing. I'd, I had to drag out every piece of music I'd ever learned. And when I won that, which was like, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I was the, the first harpist ever to win, there was for all instruments, in 38 years, and the first British musician ever to win. And then they, I won a Carnegie Hall recital. And so I came back to do the Carnegie Hall recital. And on that day, as always, there's a story, there was a transit strike in New York, and there was no one to bring my audience to me. So the son of Marcel Grangeny, who used to run the Red Cross there, um, kindly, got together all my audience and the place was full thanks to the harpist in New York at the time for helping me out and it was phenomenal um, and I got then to me on that on that panel was Pearl Shertok whom I didn't know and I played I was playing the whole Pearl Shertok suite around the clock mm -hmm. having just played Hindemith and Bach and you know the serious things and and I thought what are they going to think I'm playing something very light, but I'm going to show my different side. Why should I not? I didn't know she was on the panel. And when she, when we, when I finished playing, she clapped, clapped, and she, she stood up and said, "Oh, gee, I just need to let you know I'm Pearl Shertok." And can you imagine how I felt? I was dead. I thought, "That's it. I'm out. I've just done something terrible." But anyway, she liked it. Um, and um, the following year, she invited me to play in her summer course, um, and um, which was in near, near in the new in New York State. And then I got to travel around, and, and I got to um, play in that in in that place. And again, we forgot. Well, we we mixed up the ticket to come home. She thought I had a ticket. I thought she had a ticket. I had a recital back in London. I had to come back for it. I had to queue up all night in JFK on the floor. I came back and I had pneumonia. I still went and did my recital and then I came home and I was ill for a while after that. But it was a great experience. I made some lifelong friends um, from that trip, to be honest with you. Um, Glory, if you're out there, Glory Celeste, my very good friend who helped me to take me to JFK when there was no, no, no gas over there. There was no petrol for the cars and she found some somewhere and she took me there. And we've been lifelong friends ever since. So I've had some great, great trips with, with competitions, but not specifically harp ones. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends, of course, what the reason for the harp. Oh, I can't hear you. Well, I'm just Jana, saying. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you very well. Yes. Oh, I didn't hear you. 
Yeah, now I can hear you again. Yes. No, it depends. Uh, what is the reason for the harpies to go for the competitions? Because, of course, it, for for example, for me, it was the reason that I did not have money to buy the harp. So for me, the only chance was if I will really work hard and will have a chance to to succeed and to win the harp. It was the main goal. So it was the the. So and there are always people who just want to really compete, who wants to really cheat, like with whom you are better and so on. But it's it's it always depends on how you take the competition as an important. So everybody has different view. You can learn from everything anyway, can't you? And all these in the harp, you become friends with them, and that's good. Then you can share repertoire as well, and all these things. I'm not against them. I couldn't do them. It wasn't for me. I'm not against them at all. I I I, I taught some people who did go in for them, um, and I think that, that that's really vital. That the, everybody has to do the thing they did. You speak about a money and having a harp. Well, um, if you knew how I came back by my life, um, I, I started off in a small Welsh village with lots of music around me and lots of spoken word and going to chapel, quite religious, learning by playing hymns. We had no money to buy. There were no many, there were no many uh, harp specific books at the time. So I used to play the hymn book. Uh, the hymns were brilliant. So I used to play them, then I used to transpose them, do variations on them. And then um, on, a, on a Saturday, I was allowed to have a bit of pocket money and I used to spend it all on piano music in the market at Chester, which was not far from my home, um, and come home and then play all these tunes that were piano tunes or well-known arrangements of, you know, things. So that's what I did. And I had a very old harp, um, a, a very, very old harp. And eventually, when I went to music college, uh, my first harp teacher, Maya Jones, was an orchestral harpist. And I've got that to thank for her for everything of that beginning. She taught me to play orchestrally, how to count, how to how to take food with me to make sure I'm, uh, I'm a flask and, a, and a, this and that all practical things, um, and um, then when I went to college I studied with in Wales with Elena Bennett, um, and she said your harp's not good enough you can't carry on the pedal's not working it was a very old air it wasn't it wasn't working so I said well don't tell my mum and dad because they can't do nothing you know nothing they can do, I went home one day and there was a new salvi great soundboard harp in my house. And my mom said, right, I need to explain. That's your harp. We've sold the house to buy the harp. And I'm going now to work as warden of the first ever sheltered housing for all people in North Wales. And my home will be, I can't say this without crying, my home will be there. And that's what she did. And I told her, don't do it. I wish you hadn't done it because it's too much pressure. She had no pressure whatsoever. It's because you have a talent. You've been told you have a talent. We know you have one. So now is your opportunity. We don't want anything in return, just that you're happy. It doesn't matter if you succeed or not, but you have an opportunity. It's not about succeeding even. It's just about knowing that you've worked so hard and to give you the chance. And the only sad thing is that um, my illness is hereditary. So I get it from my mom and dad both. Um, and my mom died uh, not very, very long after moving into that particular place. Um, because of complications with things with, that come from the illness. And, but I'm grateful to her forever and to my whole family for, you know, uh, starting me off. And all, I, I think my mom knew I was on the very lowest rung of a very high ladder when I won Carnegie Hall. They gave me cassette tapes. I bought my mom a cassette player. She was in hospital at the time. Massive thing, like a brick. And I played her all my tapes from all the rounds they gave me. And she, all she said when I came back from America was, did you enjoy yourself? I said, yes, ma'am. Are you happy? Yes, ma'am. And by the way, ma'am, I won. Oh, that's okay, then you won. That's, but are you happy? That's <laughs> all so, it mattered to my mother. And I tried to look at that ever since because we didn't know what was wrong with her and, and um, we didn't know why she died like this. But, you know, you know, I've got her behind me saying, go on, be strong, <laughs> be strong, you know, keep going. And... You you'll succeed. I, I I I hope that she knows. I think she knows that that I've done all right. So I've done okay. Oh, what a what a really tough path you you went through. It's unbelievable. We have there also uh, questions from Anna Verkolhanceva, who we greet very much to Vienna. She's asking if you can tell us a little bit more about your interesting instrument. You played uh, the, the harp with with organ. With organ. I've only I've not I've not played. Why does she think I played with organ? I've only done the the usual grand genie aria in, in um, classic style. You know the grand genie one. Or did you say organ? 
there is written uh, that if you can please tell us a little bit about the interesting instrument you played the harp with organ details. Oh, I think I know what you mean now. I thought you meant with the organ. I know exactly what you mean. Uh, she means. Uh, okay, so I've got a picture of it here because if you haven't seen it, you might like to see it. Do you mean this? Absolutely. Can you see that? Oh, maybe you can put it a little bit higher to, to pull it up a little bit. Yes, that's it. Oh, wow. Okay. Can wow. you see that? Yes, we can see that now. Yes, amazing. Well, that's called a Savida harp. And um, the other interesting thing that I've done in my life is that my second husband is Iranian. So I married an Iranian, and that got me interested in Iranian music. He's a mathematician, but he got me interested in Iranian music. And I've worked with a couple of Iranian composers, young ones, in this country. And I once had the opportunity to go to Iran with my pedal harp, which was a bit of a crazy idea. Um, but I did it and I loved it and the audience was from three-year-old to 90-year-old fantastic um, and then of recently last year I worked with a young composer with the London Symphony Orchestra doing um, um, a project with some of their players the leader and a few other players a chamber project um, and the this composer and I went to around together and the composer called Amir Konjani he created this harp he didn't build it a company called abassi harps in tehran built it i went to their shop in tehran because i can go to iran because i'm married in iran and i have i can get in and out of iran no problem and the people are wonderful the place is astounding um and i love it to pieces um and i went there to try the harp out before it was properly finished and what it is is i'm sure you may be able to look it up so that i don't get it in in, you know saying correctly about it but it is an instrument which is a, a normal pedal harp um actually this was not a pedal harp sorry this he builds pedal harps but this was a lever harp but it's a big lever harp so sometimes i had to stand up to play the levers i don't play lever harp even i had to learn a whole new technique uh, absolutely from scratch um and then uh, the composer has these um wonderful um pipes that come out and on the end of the pipes the things you see at the end they're like tomback drums so they make a sound like drum and from the drum comes a spiral of um, um a wound spiral of steel that comes in and clips onto a string so when you pluck that string it instead of making the sound of a a, a note well it can make a note but it also plucks the drum it plucks the drum and so it, it creates something totally totally different of a sound um, and um, it was an extraordinary project. He is an extraordinary composer and creator. It's not just composer, creator. Um, you know, to create something like that um, is phenomenal. Um, and and I'm in for these crazy projects. I'm not sure I'll be doing them ever again because I have to stop somewhere. Um, but that was, I think that's what she was meaning. And an, another person I know wanted me to say something about the Kamak Midi Harp because the Kamak Midi Harp I was the first ever to play it in public and I, I played a concerto with the BBC Symphony Orchestra on this. Can you see this one? That's the Kamak Midi Harp. Maybe turn it a little bit to your uh, left, to your right then. Yes. Can you see the Midi Harp? Yes, no. only the column now. Maybe lift it up a little bit now so that we can see whole, maybe a little bit more up still. Still lift it up, please, a little bit. Yes. Okay, it's a black one. You can't see much of a difference there because the MIDI part is all on the side. It has the connections on the side. And, and what happened with that was I had no idea to play anything but my beautiful Hongach and my wonderful harp. I've stuck with it everywhere. I take it with me everywhere. But I, um, when that harp came along, I had no intention of playing any other kind of harp because I'm small in stature. I'm 4'11". I have a problem with pain. My, because of my illness always constant so i have to think can i pluck it because it's a different kind of thing but it came around long story short um people were asked to try it out in london so of course i went along because i'm interested in everything new um and um i had to go on it and they they showed on i don't know how it works because i'm not technologically minded but during the time of trying it out at the royal academy of music they had a screenshot of when you play they showed how strong your signal was by the notes on the screen. And when I played, I played some John Parry, which was ridiculous on it, but I thought he showed a lot of finger work. 
So I played that and they said, wow, wow, every note is playing. It's your harp, it's your harp, you should do it. I said, no, 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 I, no, I'm not going to do it. Anyway, I did play it, a very controversial piece by Graham Fitkin, a wonderful English composer. And it's controversial because it, I didn't hardly play any notes of music. Most of the MIDI notes were attached to the voices of living politicians, both in America and in uh, Britain, talking about the Iran-Iraq war. And it was controversial because we had to ask permission from the White House and London for, to, to, to um, use these clips of things. And um, it had a lot of publicity. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was something absolutely amazing. It took me a long time, again, to listen to two speakers with me on it, two speakers with the orchestra on it, the orchestra were listening to me. There were about eight speakers, I think. It's not something you can take to a normal um, concert hall very easily. It, it was easy. It's broadcast on the BBC, or everything I've done has been broadcast on BBC, but <laughs> that's about it. Um, and then that's it. That's another kind of thing that I do. <laughs> Sian, can you just tell me, these kind of very unique harps, do they, do they exist somewhere, or it was just like like a part of, of some project and they are not um, alive anymore. Okay, that particular harp, the, the Sovida harp with the pipes, that was made specially for that particular thing. I was the first harp he's ever to play on it. Now I don't know quite what's happening to it. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, I'm not playing with it anymore because I, 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 you know, you choose a path to go on later. I've done this now. Um, and um, I hope somebody else does play it. This is an extraordinary instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think there'll be any others built. Well, I don't know. That's not my right to say. But it's because you're not going to have many of them. It's very complex. You have to take two hours to put it on, up in the, the things in and out every time. And you need a lot of space for the harp, a huge amount of space. So I'm not sure what the future for that harp is, but I hope it has a, a, a glorious future and that somebody does it because these things are unique and they're not gimmicks. You know, this is a fine musician who's, who's creative and wonderful. It's not, I don't do gimmicks, you know. Lots of people want to stick things on the harp and that's fine. And if it's in a creative way, I don't, I go with anything, but I won't damage my harp. I won't put things on my hongacher, but if it's a new instrument or a different kind, you, you, should, you should go for it. But from, from, from my opinion, I don't know about that harp, what's happening now with it particularly. But it was only one piece in the whole world, right? Or it has been more, more harps like that? No, it was only last year, so it's very new anyway. And for a composition to be written for it was complicated. It only happened last year. So to be fair, there's not been any time and the composer is writing for all sorts of things amazing instruments that he he creates himself and works on himself so he's <laughs> got so much going on probably that i don't know um that that it comes again you know um maybe is it possible that after we finish our interview i will ask you kindly to send me the pictures of of this harp so that i can get there clearly Absolutely, yes, you're welcome. Yes, of course I can. I mean, I love doing new things, but um, you know, now, as I say, I'm also trying to go back a bit and do some retrospective things for myself because um, I'm always so I've been always so busy with my life that, to be honest, I've always moved on to the next project. But somebody asks me, and I can't refuse. That's how I am. Whereas now, I think I do have to reflect a little because um, what happened to me at the in the symphony orchestra, I had the most wonderful time. If you can imagine the number of People I've worked with, the composers, the conductors. You know, my first conductor was, was Sir Andrew Davis. And I did my very final concert with the orchestra with Sir Andrew. And, and, and um, Sakiri Oramo, the Finnish composer, was um, the last com conductor that I worked with there. He was the last principal conductor. But in the meantime, there was Jerzy Belaklavik, who I adored, that we worked with. Um, you know, sadly passed away. Just a wonderful, wonderful orchestra to work with these people and composers. Um, and I was hoping to stay there until I decided to leave at the age of 65. I said, this is enough. I'm a young person has to have opportunity. You have one harpist in a job or two. Actually, I had the most wonderful, hello, Louise, if you're there, co-principal harpist, mm -hmm. my friend from life, Louise Martin. And we had it because new music, like we had written, had a lot of separate, big, difficult two harp parts mm -hmm. and therefore needed two in the orchestra a lot of times. Anyway, I'm there playing away thinking, here we go. Um, I'm going to play a prom with Vaughan Williams music, which is very hard for the harp, with Andrew Davis conducting, enjoying myself enormously, but suddenly realizing that I couldn't see very much. And here's 5,000 people live in the Albert Hall, where I was every summer. 
and millions on radio, who knows, on Radio 3 Live. Um, and at the end of the concert, um, I quickly realized that I had a serious sight problem. So I was I quickly went to a big hospital called Moorfields in London. And um, sadly, she said, the, the specialist said, we think that you've got a detached retina. Um, so um, we don't think we can operate. You've lost one sight in one eye. And I said, no, 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 I'm a musician, I'm a harpist, I need to see, please do an operation, please try. And she said, okay, we'll try. And to be fair, they've been absolutely wonderful. They gave me one operation that day, about two and a half hours, and I had to do my meditation and all my visualization because there was there was no no um, anesthetic, um, and it was scary. Um, but I did all of those things, and I prayed like mad, and I said, "Get me through it." I got through it, and over the period of fourteen months, I had um, I think five major operations to save the eye and each time was getting better and better so I was really happy but I couldn't drive I couldn't really play I was a bit fu fuzzy and at the end very sadly on the very last operation it all went badly wrong and I have lost the sight in one eye and therefore um, I decided that I thought for my well-being um, and everything else I should sadly, very sadly, leave the orchestra. And um, I, I decided to do that. I didn't want to do that, not at that time. Um, but um, I'm regrouping, should we say, still regrouping, because it was devastating. Um, and, um, but I've had to regroup, as you know, several times. So here we go. This is the next, the next part of my life now. Um, and so um, everything has changed a lot. But things are constantly changing in everybody's lives. So we just have to get on with it and just do the best we can. I used to have a big teaching practice. I was head of department at Trinity College of Music, London. Um, and the, the, the college was down the road from the building which we used to rehearse in, in, in um, Maida Vale for the BBC Symphony Orchestra. So I could combine the two really well. Um, and I did that for many, many years. And then the Trinity College moved. Are we on standstill? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Well, I'm on standstill picture here, but it doesn't matter. I can hear you too. Um, the Trinity College moved to another part of London, like miles away, um, and over the river to the other side. And again, I had to give it up because I couldn't physically go from this place where I was learn uh, playing with the orchestra to South London to, um, to, to teach anymore. I tried it for two years, and I then had to give up my wonderful... Um, teaching practice. Luckily, of course, carried on brilliantly. Um, now it's Gabriella Delonio taking it, and it's fine. It's all going really well. Imogen Bath took it over from me, and then later on, it moved on. But of course, that meant in one minute, I had a wonderful department. I created the first ever integrated harp department in, in Britain um, when I brought in all the, I think, all the necessities for students to learn with, you know, not just how to play a harp really well and really thoroughly with technique and all the music, musical thing, but also how to live, how to survive, how to play background music, how to do your finances, how to write a CV, how to write a biography. They thought it was a nuisance, but they also got the better of me because I was great at giving parties. So they enjoyed Ali cooks very well Iranian food. So they know my house. All my students know our house very, very well. We had great times together and I miss it really a lot, but th there's no way I can do everything in life. <laughs> now, as I said already once, you are amazingly strong women and you really went through a very difficult period of times, but you are still shining and you are still really <laughs> feeling everything and taking everything positively, which is a inspiring, inspiring for all of us and inspiration for all of us. So I just want to ask also, you went to the orchestra, we were talking about it, you were there for 30 years, right? 28 officially as a member, but I played with them for over 30 years, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And now in these days, when we have all these, this, of course, lockdown problems that we are all at home, what is your now, you are searching on the music of John Thomas or what is your, what is your day look like? Well, I have, to, I have to really tell you that I've been president of the UK Harp Association for a long time, um, longer than is normal, I think. Um, and I've been privileged because it means that I get to meet a lot of harpists and we do some good work. We have a fantastic um, a committee who does it all 
uh, voluntarily. Um, uh, I've been involved with far longer than I've been a president. I was doing things, but that is a very important uh, part of my life, has been, um, and will always be part of my life. This is the logo. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yes, make it a little bit down. Yes, and to the, yes, then, uh, no, the other opposite way. Yes, that way. Oh, gosh, it's very hard. Sorry. It, it, <laughs> It's always contrary. Yes. So that's our logo. And we also, of course, the most important thing now is next year's World Health Congress in Cardiff. Um, and I'm, I'm also on this committee. And um, this is, I've been, to, every time I do a recital, I always do something like um, um, a little mini exhibition of things which are important for, for, for the audiences to see what the harpists can do. So I take some um, pictorial things and then I take things like this, which is, now, can we see that? It's for the Congress next yeah, year. Yeah, Congress next year. And of course, we have in our, uh, this is our, this is our, oh, can you, this is our UKJ magazine. And inside this time is the article over, you know, t explaining, you're coming yourself to do Duo Concerto, are you not? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. So there's always these, all these fantastic things happening. You know, and C Cardiff is the most wonderful, vibrant um, capital city. So we're going to, I'm going to now say, this is an ad for the World Health Congress next year. We're thanking Yana for this one, uh, for people to see what we did in the past. And now the new one with all the new things that didn't happen in Vienna, obviously, with all the specialist harps that we have now, the world harps that we have, the contemporary harp, the lever harps, the, the electric and the, and the sonic things that we have. So it's going to be a bumper, marvelous week, I reckon. Um, so I'm sorry it's been obviously moved till next year, which is very sad. And actually, you say all these things about me and being strong. I wouldn't be strong without other people. So the Harp Association, I've had a lot of great things and people helping. But also my local community, people forget that we can't be harpists, musicians, or anybody in the world if we don't have good communities to live in and people who care. I've been on lockdown because my illness is, it shouldn't have COVID at all. So I can't shop. My husband's not supposed to shop. So my kind neighbors are doing it. And I'm just thinking that all the communities we're in, be it harp community or other communities, more important than anything else is to share kindness and understanding and, 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 and help each other, be it with music or anything else. And just share, share some share some happiness and yeah i've been down a lot but i never fail to come back up eventually uh, it takes some time but but with other people helping and you're giving me this chance today to to speak a bit um i'm really really grateful because i'm not a good publicist in this respect and i'm re i was absolutely petrified when you asked me um but i am really grateful to you for giving us all of us that have been on the opportunity to come and speak to you Dear Sionet, you can't imagine how I'm really moved by all your words which you are sharing today with us. And I, I really admire you incredibly as a person, as a harpist, as, as an artist. So, I mean, we have really, as I said, you as an inspiration and you motivated everybody for everything <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I've had massive motivation given to me by uh, plenty. All my students, all the harpists here in the UK, who do nice things, uh, you know. And yes, you asked me what I'm doing now. Well, I'm working with these two at the moment, these two organizations. But of course, my research is taking me some time. But I'm going to try. If you look at my website, it's hopeless. You see, I'm not good with technology and I haven't really needed to have it. So it's behind times. I've done so much. I've recorded so much. I've done many CDs. You know, I don't know whether what my last CD was. Oh, yeah, I do a lot of programs with words and music. Um, and I do things which are important to me. So it's, some of the music I've just recorded was about Dylan Thomas, the Welsh poet, with a brilliant singer called Roderick Williams, who's internationally well known, and a solo about the drowning of a village in North Wales to give to give water to Liverpool. A terrible occasion in the lives of Welsh people. Yeah, these sort of things move me. So I need to let you know what I'm doing. <laughs> I also do ordinary things like play Debussy dances, which is not ordinary, but with the Brodsky string quartet on a CD. That's one of my last CDs because I do what everyone does. I do a lot of normal harp music, but I like doing different things as well. And I'm just going to try and see how it goes. And 
I promise everybody that knows me that I will behave and not overdo it and try to be good um, and, um, you know, go from there really, see how it goes. I really wish you, Shionet, all my best. And I'm talking not only from my side, but certainly from in behalf of everybody who is listening and who is with us today and who will be later on the on the video when they will watch later on the video also. So I'm sure we all really love you and we wish you only the best, a lot of health. And certainly everybody should go to look for your websites and should go to your CDs as give well. Give me a month, please. Give me a month, please. <laughs> No, you certainly you should you should be proud of yourself because really there is so few people as you are. So we are very thankful that you had time for us today to share all your experiences. If you will allow me, I will be very happy to invite you again in a few months so that we can share more experiences again after these few months which will be passing and now I'm sure everybody is looking forward to hear the fantastic performance of Shionet, the Third World Harp Congress, where she performed, as is written also in the banner, there she performed the Spiders of Paul Peterson, and um, you will really enjoy it. You will hear at the same performance also two more harpists uh, who were performing at the same concert, which means on the concert of the new music. And I would like to invite you in two hours from now in another for another interview which will be with Sonia Inglefield she is in the uh, United States so she has a morning at this moment and maybe she's with us already so I would like to very kindly invite you for today one more interview at five o'clock the European time but she on it once more thank you very much all my best wishes take care all of you take care stay safe thank you so much it's been my pleasure thank you so so much and I really hope to be in contact very soon and looking for a cup of tea face to face and not with the computer next time. Absolutely. Absolutely. How we've we gone throughout the world and all of us together, joining together in one place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward. Take care and all my best wishes to Thank everyone. You so Thank you. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye bye.